Angela Janab, and we're back at NACE 2015 for another episode of Repair University. And well, this time we're talking something about that that I really like a lot, and that's estimating. You know, it's the one thing in the shop I tell everybody that actually, you know, brings your money. It's the estimates that you write, but it's something that we kind of struggle with. So we thought we'd take a little time over here and come up with a 10 tips for being a better estimator. And I couldn't have two better people to talk with that topic about. So guys, let's go to topic number one. So my first tip for being a better estimator just simply comes into slow down. Any thoughts on that from, you know, Larry, you teach a lot of SMA classes, Jason, you teach a lot of group hitting classes. What do we think about just slowing down? Well, it, it, you, guys are always so rushed, the girls, guys, the damage assessor, I hate the word estimator, the damage assessor is usually very poised for trying to do multiple different things. Make the time that you can concentrate on the car. Start in one spot on the car and work your way through it. Have a process, develop something. Look everywhere, stay within the family, stay on the bumper, move to the fender, stay on the fender, move to the apron assembly, whatever the case is, if you need to take it apart, then take it apart, take your time and go through it. You can't just quickly look at these things because that's when all the mistakes happen and you wind up with massive supplements and you don't want to have that happen. Jason, what's your experience? Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, no two collisions are the same, I don't think, so you can't just make assumptions that, well, I've already dealt with this vehicle and a similar collision, because it might have different options on it, it might have different materials, it might be a mid-year change, you know, perhaps that is uh, you know, a higher strength steel than, than that was on the previous version of it, and that happens all the time, so I think definitely slowing down and, and being thorough and making sure you're finding all that damage, making sure you're measuring the vehicle, you know, doing the blueprinting tears, you know, some tubs tearing out to identify things, because rather do it in the beginning, rather than have it do a, a little bit later in the, in the process. And I think both you kind of bring up, and that's a great lead in to tip number two. So tip number two for being a better estimator is develop a repeatable routine. So no matter what the damage is to the car, whether it's a front impact, a side impact, a small bumper job, or a severe impact, be able to have a repeatable plan that you attack every car with because, well, that prevents a lot of those mistakes. And what kind of a plan, or have you seen a lot of estimators using lately, Jay? You know what? You know, I think it ties in your first your first tip of slowing down again, making sure that you've got that process in place going through the blueprinting process, a systematic approach to every vehicle that comes in there, uh, regardless where the damage is, making sure that you're not missing anything, because when you don't slow down, when you don't have a plan, uh, that's when things get missed, I think. Right, exactly. Larry, you know, we talk a lot about, about doing the same thing each time with the car, and, and that's that repeatable routine. What's the value in that to an estimator? Well, the, the biggest thing I can tell you is, is that as a, as a damage assessor, when you look at the car, you start in the opposite area of damage, is what I try and teach all the time. Because we know where the car is damaged. If it's hitting the left front corner area, you want to start with the right rear tail light and work your way back in. Find the stuff that, that's undamaged, work through that, and then get to the harder area. Once you get to the harder area, do some of your quick checks, quick measurements, and once you verify that the car has structural damage or something that you're questioning, like Jason said, that's when you want to pre-measure the car during the blueprint, triage, uh, uh, x-ray portion, whatever you want to call it, and then start getting the car taken apart so you can see what's there. Once again, you know, within reason, you take the fender off, the bumper cover, see what's behind there, because you, you don't know sometimes. And that's, that's the big thing, like Jason and, and you said, slow down. Keep a predictability of how you look at the car. Keep a predictability of when you measure uh, mechanically and then when you have to measure electronically. Right, now that repeatable routine is gonna allow you to always be able to write consistently regardless of how severe the damage is. So for a lot of people when you're first starting out at estimating, you may start in a fast track repair environment, a drive-in environment, where you're looking at traditionally small impacts. And then that first big hit comes in and you're writing that first $12,000, $15,000 estimate. And it can be really overwhelming, but it's good to know that that same routine I developed with that $500 hit is the same routine that's gonna take me through that $15,000 hit. So I can't write the hit unless I kinda know what I'm working on. So our third tip for being a better estimator is, well, know your system. So where are things in your grouping, your particular estimating system that you're using at that time? Are you familiar with where everything is in that system? But Jason, we wish we could get the software companies to kind of all do it the same, but some things are just in different places. Absolutely, yeah. It's just, you know, knowing your system is important. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool that you've got at your disposal, and, um, you know, if you want, uh, you know, treat your welder, you know, because that's a, that's a tool. You want to know that machine intimately so that you work with that. Same thing with the information provider system, is making sure that you know, you know, where to find the included and not included operations, how to go through the whole process. Again, putting that back to your number two tip, you know, that standard operating procedure, so knowing how 
how you can go through that, a systematic approach each and every time. And again, you know, like I said, knowing, knowing the tools that you've got and, uh, and uh, make, make, make them maintain as well. And uh, there's a lot of good information in there that uh, a lot of people might not even know about. Well, that brings me to my next tip for being a better estimator. So I don't care if you're in the shop or if you're an adjuster for an insurance company or you're even an independent adjuster. At some point, you're going to be negotiating and discussing what you're going to write, whether it's in the supplement environment or whether it's in the original inspection environment. And so the next tip is not only know your system, but know the other systems. Now our repair shops do that very well. Very few repair shops left still have a single system, but a lot of our insurance companies or IAs are maybe used to working on one. What are the benefits in knowing how all of the systems work when it comes to being a better estimator at my facility? I, I think it goes back to the, the last tip again about knowing your tools, and it might not be your tool, but it's a tool that you're now gonna have to use potentially. Um, knowing the processes that your, your partners expect um, and having that, that information at your fingertips is, uh, is critical. Larry, you deal with this a lot, you know, at your shop every day. So what are the advantages when you know each and every system intimately and that helps you be a better estimator? Too many shops and insurance company adjusters, uh, the damage assessor and the insurance adjuster are arguing over included operations on one system, not included operations on another system, and they're wasting time. If you know the difference between the three systems, and ASA, who's sponsoring NACE this year, actually has a, a, a booklet that, that, that they give to their members where you can purchase for like 15 bucks. It tells you the differences between the systems and, you know, like a bumper cover, a, a fender, whatever the case may be. So you got an idea what's there, but my biggest issue is, is that guys don't read the P pages, not even their own. Now, when you add up all three database systems, and I'm not talking how to total a car route or definitions, I'm talking just the real P pages, you're talking 168 pages between the three database systems added together of just included and not included. Granted, uh, Autotex has a long chart, so they take up more pages, about 100 pages. Uh, uh, Mitchell's about uh, 22 pages and, and CCC's about 38 of useful information on included and not included. If you, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to know 168 pages. That's not a lot. You know, what's that, what, one chapter in an ICAR class if you, if you actually printed out the book? It's not a lot of information, but nobody, nobody knows it. You study those pages, now you understand it. So now, if you're from the insurance company, we're discussing something, it's like, well, uh, didn't you bring this up? No, on your system it's included, leave that alone. But this is not included in your system, and, and you, you, you can easily negotiate better instead of making it a, a dumb argument. It's like what Jason said and you said, it's going back to know your system, know the other systems. Now, one of the tips for being a better estimator that took me a while to kind of grasp early on in my career was, you know, the body shop technician and the painter are not the only person that should own a set of tools or be able to have other tools in their kit to work with. Um, you know, from screwdrivers to pry bars to, to your camera to maybe the two post lift in the shop. Jason, in the estimating basics, what are some of the things that are kind of a common tool that an estimator, besides having a really good system and a tablet yeah. and, and the computer-based products, what are some of the other tools that an estimator needs to do the job? Well, you know, so, uh, you know, point-to-point -point measuring is a good way to get some quick visual you know, indicators, um, certainly being armed with the OEM information at that point, you know, a flashlight to get some, you know, hidden areas to see what you're looking at. Um, you know, get the vehicle up in the air possibly if you have to suspect this from you know underbody damage as well. So um, again, it's uh, the blueprinting process. I think really helps a lot of that because now you can bring in your 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 um, your peers and have their expertise as well. So you don't have to rely solely on uh, you know on the knowledge of that of that damage appraiser necessarily. You can you know leverage people that are in there and make sure that you're pulling the uh, proper information early on uh, so you know what you're dealing with. Now, Larry, you hit on my next step a little earlier. So you went ahead of the game. You're you're ahead of the class as usual. Uh, but my next tip is, and I like to separate these out, I like to tell estimators, I really want you to know the system, so I want you to know each of the, the categories in the estimate, where things are, but now, secondarily, I really want you to know those P pages. I think the only way to be a great estimator in this industry is to know those 168 pages that you talked about. And, and Jason, over the years, you know, with ICAR and the work that y'all are doing with not only the OEMs, but the way that all the substrates and the replacement methods yeah. and joining methods are changing, those P pages have changed drastically over just even the last five years. Let's talk about what the P pages mean, how they work with replacement processes, and you know how you see, because you get to see that big picture, how you see that fitting in. Yeah, it's um, it certainly continues to change and evolve, and. Um, again, knowing your system and knowing what's in there and what is included, not included, and, and how to go through that whole process and identify each of those uh, 
critical elements in it is, is just, if you don't know, you just, you're, you don't know. And uh, as uh, one of our ICAR uh, instructors always says, you don't know what you don't know. Um, sometimes you don't even know that you don't know about it. And so again, having that information and knowing how to use that and how to leverage that, you know, during the damage analysis process, how to write a thorough, you know, assessment sheet on it. Um, there's no other way to do it, you know, unless you actually, you know, that system very well. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's critical to make sure that you are uh, familiar with it. Now you have a damage analysis class that even kind of covers that, making sure that the estimator learns how that it's not just what I click, there's all these other things to go look at. Yeah, we do cover, we, we get into that, how to use the P pages, you know, what, you know, what, uh, what does, uh, what, well, how the deductions work, overlap, you know, so that's one of our basic estimating courses, you know, obviously Larry's got his uh, stuff that he does as well, uh, but uh, it's certainly an area I think that we could also continue to expand and maybe work even closer with the information providers and you know, maybe even develop some uh, some class on how to use each of the different systems and, and how to navigate through there, because, you know, they've got, certainly got their information, but I don't know how, uh, how, how widely used it is people are, how, how much awareness is out there. Yeah, now when I remember when I started writing, we were still using the Mitchell Crash Book. Yeah. And so my, we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't afford as a small shop, you know, the latest and greatest yeah. computer estimating systems. And I, so I grew up handwriting estimates, and I actually didn't write my first computer estimate until 1995. And that was the old WAN system. Everybody remember that one? Yes. But uh, I think I think being able to handwrite estimates back then taught us a lot yeah. about how to use those guys. Well, I have an eye stone and a chisel. <laughs> it took you forever to get it. That's why cars take so long. Yes. <laughs> Larry, you and I talk about the P pages a lot and what we get out of them. Now, for you, that's really where the payment, the bread and butter of the shop that's the money Bible. comes from. Yeah. That's the Bible. How do you what use them? Um, you have to use everything in them. You have to encompass all three database systems, know the insurance company and what they're writing. Because an insurance company is not going to walk in and say, hey, Larry, what do you write on? I'll write on CCC. Okay, let me open up my computer database system. I'll write on CCC. Uh, uh, they go to your shop and you go, well, I write on Autotext. Oh, hang on. Same adjuster. Let me write on Autotext for you. Go to Jason's shop and we write on Mitchell. Oh, okay, let me write on Mitchell. No, they don't do that. It's different systems, uh, different included items, even sometimes different pagination on how they get printed it out depending on how the system works so you really got to understand that system and how it works you also need to utilize uh, what they give you as far as aluminum high strength steel ultra high strength steel and even then that tells a little bit more maybe I'm jumping the gun you need to know some of the OEM information on materials because the Germans or the Europeans classify steels a little differently than the Asians the Americans and I said on an SAE board we're trying to get them to agree upon one classification not multiple for example I remember when somebody told me one time in one of the database systems it listed the rocker panel on a Volvo is ultra high strength steel. We all know from my car classes for years, beat into our head, don't, don't do anything with ultra high strength steel. Well, wait a second, there's a sectioning procedure in this database system, but it says ultra high strength steel. Well, that's because their ultra high strength steel is actually a high grade high strength steel, and their advanced high strength steel is actually what we would consider ultra high strength steel in America. And, and it's turned out, we all know a paralegal helps out a lawyer immensely. The damage assessors have to become like para engineers and metallurgist in a way because they have to understand this stuff to be able to you know relate it from paper to practicality for the you know for the uh, shop technician so you don't actually have to be able to physically fix the car but you have to know what's going on that's why our car i think has developed what nine or ten classes that are on damage analysis because there's so much involved in it i mean you, you have two three courses on on just metallurgy alone that that's how much it's it, it's got involved in here. That has nothing to do with car repair. It's just knowing what's in the car, and that's how difficult it is now. So you really have to educate yourself and get out there and talk. And when you don't understand something, you know, call up. You got to ask iCar. You know, type into iCar. Ask them. I know I've built plenty of phone calls for like questions. Like I look at the phone and go, really. Really, I mean, come on, <laughs> you know. But you do it anyway because you're trying to help out and get people to come into you, yeah. you know, come into the, 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 the knowledge. I think Jason's getting tired of me asking questions. Yeah. When he opened up that Ask iCar thing, and I was like, yes. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so I'm limited great. to one a day now. Yeah, but I, I thought I, yeah. I, I, he didn't like when I sent in. Do I look good in this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wants me to talk to you later about that. <laughs> We're going to get on to that. Well, Larry, I think you're reading from the playbook because we're going to get into my next tip. You know, 
one of the things that's, that I find so impressive about estimators in today's environment, insurance and in the collision repair environment, is you truly do have to be a know-it-all. And it's one of these industries where you don't necessarily have to do it all, but estimators do have to know it all because we've got to be able to estimate it properly. And Jason, I hear this over and over and it kind of drives me a little crazy, so we're going to talk about it. I hear shops and adjusters saying, you know, I've been writing estimates for 10 years. ICAR has nothing to offer me as an estimator. And I go, my God, they got everything to offer you. Let's talk about how important it is for an estimator to have all of the training and the knowledge available. Well, I don't think an estimator or an insurance auto physical damage appraiser either, for that matter, um, could have too much training. Um, I think every course that ICAR offers, the always offer, all, all that is, is good information for the estimator in front end because um, knowing what you're going to deal with, what your technician are going to be dealing with is, is, is critical. Um, for the ICAR professional development program, we allow um, every course that we have essentially as continuing education for our estimators because you, you, you can't have too much information. Um, you might not actually ever install that rivet, but knowing up front you know, what an SPR is and how they are removed and how they're installed uh, will help you develop that repair plan because it all starts there. Um, having that only information, knowing what you're doing, whether it's with an extrusion or a cash bar, what you can and can't do with each of those, um, is, is again, if you're looking at it, you don't know what you're dealing with, um, you can't write an effective uh, damage assessment on it. Uh, knowing, knowing where the high strength steels are located, and again, you know what you can and can't do. Um, you might not have that OEM information right at your fingertips, but if you're looking at a, a late model vehicle that's got some B-pillar damage on it, you know almost distinctly that, I'm not going to be able to straighten that. If, I've got, if I can see that vis visual def uh, deformation in it, uh, knowing up front that, you know what, we can't write this for straightening. We're going to have to, you know, replace that part. Um, so I, every, every course that we offer, every course we always offer, um, I think are, are applicable to, to those two roles. Yeah, exactly. Now that brings up another point of knowing, you know, what i what I got to know, I've got to have all this knowledge, I've almost got to be, I've got to be the expert to know it all in the shop is there's a kind of a misconception that OE repair information through the reportals for the OE, well, that's for the technician. And really, God, that's for the estimator. And I know, Larry, you have a, a policy where when you write estimates, your estimators know all of the repair information from the OEMs before they even start writing that first line. How do you use that in the shop? Well, depending on the manufacturer, because we're certified by certain companies, so we have actually the full access. Even with full access to Wiz or PWiz or, or Irwin, I will still sometimes still use just for quick stuff is going to all data just to find out some of the stuff and you kind of get used to the same type of car with the same repair procedures you know kind of like what you need you have little cheat sheets and listed parts and material you need but for the actual rare repair you have to go in each time and print it out my big issue is is that you need to know what some of the materials are what some of the codes are what the uh, um, uh, 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 walk around is after a collision event uh, what, what the manufacturer wants you to do uh, sometimes I print out that stuff so I can show it to the insurance company because like well I need documentation of proof it's very important to write the estimate so I mean it's imperative that you measure the car, you know your system, and you check with the OEM information as you go and repair that vehicle. If you can't find the OEM information, iCar has a link for all the websites. And I hate when guys tell me, well, I don't want to pay for it, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. It's like, really, guys, I mean, come on. A lot of it's free. Mopar, uh, uh, Ford, and, and Chevy are all free. GM are all free sites that'll give you enough information, but you, you can't write a car without the repair information. So you should have, at the bare minimum, like a third-party entity like all data. Some of the uh, estimating systems have incorporated some repair information in the sections inside this. So you might need a separate system for the tech, because you don't want the tech going into the estimating database, but the estimator can now look up some of the repair procedures. I mean, alone, like a Mercedes-Benz uh, S-Class, you need uh, almost $1,000 worth of material before you even buy the quarter pound because of all the stuff that's in this. So that's why these uh, damage assessors have to look for that type of information. It's imperative. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about what our tips are before we even get to the car, all the research and information that we're having. But my next tip for being a better estimator, we're actually going to get to the car. And that tip is touch every part you estimate. When I was doing training a lot, at one point I had about 900 estimators that rolled up under my, my list of control there. And I used to do a training exercise where we would go out and we would write maybe a fender and everyone had to keep their hand on the fender till they were done and we would, you know, finally there's the last guy touching the fender and then we would review estimates. And in any given situation, we may have a swing of price difference between $1,000 between the highest and the lowest estimate. It was fascinating that we were all looking at the same 
same part, we were all touching the same part and what a dollar difference there was in our estimates. But it really brought home the fact of staying with the group. So Jason, you do a lot of repair planning and a lot of training and develop curriculum around that. Why do we want estimators to stay with something and touch it while they're estimating before they move on? Um, if, if you can't see what you're, what you're dealing with, if you got hidden damage in there, um, you know, knowing, removing those parts, taking those parts off and understanding what is it, what is behind there, again, it's, it's, that's the only way to write a thorough estimate. Otherwise, we're going to be running into issues, we're going to be you know, doing supplements and maybe sending some information out again. Um, so again, I think just getting, getting in there, getting, you know, getting down, down on the ground and crawling under there and uh, like I said, getting the vehicle up in the air potentially, making some of those measurements um, is the only way that you can be able to be thorough. Now for our last and final tip of being a better estimator, we're actually going to bring in a special guest. We're going to talk about what it takes to show that. So uh, give me a little minute and I'm going to get Collision Edge in here and we're going to talk about our last tip, which is show your repair plan. All right guys, as promised, I brought in a special guest for my last tip for being a better estimator. And well, that tip is show your work. Well, we kind of all heard that in math class growing up and it drove us crazy. That's but right. man, Tim, it sure does make a difference being able to show what really you've does. written. So you've got some tools out there um, that just make the job a breeze. And I wanted to make sure that we, we show them to everybody out sure. there. You got two of my favorites. You've got the magnetic tapes and you've got the DIN viewer yep, board. Tell me good. about them. So all of our tools are really just photo tools. They're, they're designed to help you properly communicate the damage um, on, on the panel. It's hard a lot of times on subjective damage to really detail out where that damage is and how bad it is. Dents and rolls and all those things are hard to see a lot of times in the photos. So what this does is, is it's, it's the typical line board, guys have seen them forever. Uh, this has got a reflective backing on it though, and the backing actually grabs the camera's flash. So when you hold it to the right angle, you take the picture, the, the grid is actually redirected back across the panel and it shows every deformation in the panel, right? So the estimating sticks is actually like a four piece kit. There's a lot of things in there, sorry. Yeah. But there's, um, the rulers there are designed for uh, A, the need to blend, and we got a ruler for that, and we got a process for that. Right. We've also got, um, you know, this is the crime scene tape mm -hmm. uh, to help size dents and damage, whatever. Also to locate emblems uh, on the panel, right? So you don't know where the emblem goes exactly when you take it apart. You get a guy coming in going, hey boss, where does, this, where does this emblem go? And you spent 45 minutes trying to figure out where to put an emblem at. So that's designed for that as well. Right. So they're just designed to help aid photos in body shop. And uh, we're doing really well with them. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, you know, and I love them a lot. I know that there's sometimes there's people out there that says, well, I have an insurance company that says they don't like anything, you know, in the right. photos or whatever. And that's kind of true. You know, when it comes to a court situation, a lot of times we want free photos, meaning we don't even want your picture in them or your right. reflection as well or whatever. But we also like the photos that really document the damage. And for most shops, no matter even if the insurer accepts those as pictures for the DRP claim, you still want those pictures right. in your file for an audit or a potential situation down the road. Absolutely. And it just makes life different, especially in health situations. Absolutely. Oh my yeah, God. It's interesting that some adjusters are actually buying them now because they want to be able to support their work and show their work to the claims to the desk, right? right? So it's really interesting that it's actually working that way. It's really cool. So the yeah. insurers are getting on board with it. Great. Yeah, I know. I used to have something kind of similar. I makeshift made it my own in my early careers to do right. that for my adjusters right. and go, God, show me what you're trying to do. But one of the things I learned early in training estimators was that when, when you show your work, whether it's your photos and you're showing that process of repair or replace, it also helps you get a little bit more detailed into your estimate because you begin thinking about proving your repair plan. And that's essential to not only getting your estimate approved, but you know, the cutting down the friction between that right. shop and then right. that desk reviewer that maybe is seven states away. So Tim, you're always working on something new at Collision Edge. You're always looking for something else. New solutions I'm, to old problems. I'm, I'm looking for a tip here. I'm looking for a little inside information. What's next? What are we going to see out of you next? I don't know. I got, I got to find some more sales and some more money to keep, keep developing stuff, right? So yeah. it's really cool. Now, shops that want to look into the board or the, the magnetic tape, yep. where do they go? Uh, CollisionEdge.com. Oh, that's excellent. Well, as you can see, there's a lot of steps to being a better estimator, and a lot of them just start with the research and the homework that you do before you even get to the car. So be sure to review all the 10 steps. Take your time when you write an estimate. It's not a speed contest. It's an accuracy contest, and the better accurate you are up front, well, the faster, more efficient that repair is going to be, and the higher customer service score that you're going to have. For more tips on estimating, be sure to visit the rest of the episodes of Repair University where we break down photography and some other things in more detail. And we'll be back from NACE 2015 with more episodes to help you out.